Well, heavy industry science and technology firms, Umlion says it has not been contracted by the Volta River Authority to undertake any form of fumigation exercise in communities affected by the spillage of the Akosombo Dam. Investigative journalist Manasseh Azuri Aweni impugned impropriety when he took to Facebook to criticize an officer of VRA for announcing plans to contract Zoom Lion for fumigation activities in communities affected by the spillage uh, of the dam. But Zoom Lion says the allegations are baseless and lack any uh, factual basis. Let's bring you excerpts of the uh, statement released a couple of uh, uh, minutes ago by Zoom Lion titled uh, uh, Zoom Lion Ghana Limited and Matters Relating to uh, the fumigation exercise. It points out that the attention of the management of the uh, Zoom Lion Gun Limited has been drawn to a report on social media adapt Ibrahim Mahama, Zoom Lion, and serious questions for VRA, uh, which uh, stories seek to suggest that Zoom Lion Ghana Limited has been contracted by the Volta River Authority uh, to undertake fumigation of the lower Volta areas affected by recent controlled spillage from the Akosombo Dam. Now, that statement continues to point out that management will categorically want to uh, refute this uh, misleading, false and unfortunate assertion by uh, one Manasseh Azuri, a winner who has for the past 10 years sought to level various uh, forms of allegations against Zoom Lion to no avail. The recent publication uh, is a demonstration of Manasseh's clear disregard for journalistic integrity and professional ethics as it uh, as is expected uh, of a professional of his caliber then they go ahead to point out that uh, quote we want to emphasize that zoom lion Ghana limited has not been contracted by the volta river authority to undertake any fumigation activity in the said affected uh, area as claimed by mr awini his allegations are baseless and lack any factual basis. It is disheartening that in his pursuit of uh, sensationalism and cheap uh, popularity, Mr. Winnie has chosen uh, to interpret, uh, to misrepresent the facts as the statement is uh, pointing out. And then uh, they go ahead to talk about the fact that uh, on Monday, the 23rd of October, 2023, Zoom Lion Ghana Limited, uh, led by its executives, uh, and management presented a number of relief items worth over 500,000 cities to victims of the uh, spillage. Additionally, a sister company, uh, which is Ecozoil, uh, also donated almost 500 life jackets to the media and rescue team uh, supporting the situation on the ground. Now, at the same time, the uh, presentation, uh, that's at the same presentation event, the company, in addition to the items uh, presented, uh, uh, announced its intent to also uh, fumigate the areas once the water had receded. It is therefore uh, regrettable, as the statement is pointing out, that Mr. Manasseh Azuria Wene has chosen to overlook the uh, notable humanitarian efforts undertaken by Zoom Lion and its sister companies in support of flood victims, a gesture uh, which was widely covered uh, by various media outlets. Yet, Mr. Awini chose to disregard these facts and propagate misleading information and uh, also peddle, uh, he was peddling um, his usual falsehood against uh, the one company that has been at the forefront of keeping Ghana clean, green and healthy uh, and this is deeply concerning, the statement says. Management wishes to uh, challenge Mr. Manasseh uh, Wini uh, to provide evidence to substantiate his claims and allegations regarding the alleged contract awarded to the company. Uh, we remain unwavering in our commitment to uphold uh, our corporate social responsibility and providing a steadfast uh, support to the communities in the Volta region and uh, in other ways uh, to also uh, the, uh, to, to support the motherland Ghana despite the uh, unwarranted uh, distractions uh, which are caused by such baseless uh, accusations. So uh, this is the latest we're receiving uh, from Zoom Lion Ghana Limited. Uh, let's hear from uh, Adam Senano who's coach of the uh, Citizens Movement uh, Against Corruption. He's also uh, serving on the AU's advisory board against uh, 
anti-corruption. Thank you so much, sir, for spending some time with us. The latest uh, from Zoom Lion Ghana Limited, uh, the position it, ha it has on this whole um, fumigation exercise, uh, uh, which it will be carrying out in all districts affected uh, by the flood waters caused by this village of the dam. Uh, but beyond that, looking at the challenge which is now being thrown to Manasi Azuri, uh, do, do you feel that that should put martyrs to rest? Uh, the fact that at least Zoom Lion says it is just simply doing this as a service to, to the nation? Well, I, I think that uh, it's always good to do a cross-check. Um, for some reason, I thought I'd seen some announcement by VRE to this effect. Perhaps, um, maybe it's a Manassas right up rather. But I think it would be good to connect with Manasseh and find out whether he has evidence to the contrary, then we can draw a final curtain on, on whether uh, Zoom Lion is right about this. Mm, but, but the argument uh, has been made, uh, sorry, Adam, uh, that um, you know some officials, at least, uh, of the Volta River Authority are on record to have said that Zoom Lion uh, was contracted as to whether or not um, it, it was a matter of semantics. Indeed, there were some pronouncements that Zoom Lion was going to I carry think, out this fumigation. I, I think that's probably exactly what I was referring to, mm. that I thought I'd, I'd read somewhere something from VRE to that extent. Uh, and, and so I'm quite sure that over the next 24, 48 hours, we'll be hearing from Manasseh making reference if there were individuals who said this. Um, and so it's a third party reportage that he's using. And so the, the picking on Manasseh as someone who has an agenda may not fly if we're able to show that there was a VRA or some VRA officials were the ones who said this. In any case, I think that the, the bottom line simply is this. Um, how much more support can we give these communities that are certainly struggling? Uh, how can we governize? more items that can make their lives more comfortable mm. and what is the roadmap towards making sure that things turn around somehow we seem to have a, a, a silence around a national coordinated effort to make sure we have a clear path forward and that would have been helpful and if he, uh, zoom line is committing to give resources to that and supporting free of charge that would be great news I, I see. Um, the company in question is not new to the Ghanaian space and the anti-corruption um, space as well, knowing you know, the, the background uh, to why possibly Manasi might be raising some of these concerns. Uh, the, the World Bank reports on some of the activities and dealings of the company uh, and other issues, uh, which has been a long-drawn fight between uh, this very investigative journalist and the company itself. Should that matter when, when it comes to an issue of a national emergency, uh, emergency such as this? Uh, the fact that victims are and continue to be displaced by the activities of the floodwaters. Now the floodwaters are receding and public health should be placed first. Should we be equally concerned about you know, anti-corruption, corruption and all of that uh, related matters now? Should that also be a concern? Well, if recent history is anything to go by, when we've had crisis, uh, we've had the, uh, let me call it, the uh, corruption entrepreneurs who suddenly jump on board and find ways of scamming Ghanaians and making money off the plight of Ghanaians. It doesn't matter whether they are vulnerable and are struggling. Uh, and so under COVID, all of a sudden, uh, you had people hiking up prices, um, and those who are saying they're offering services, uh, those who are saying that they're going to import vaccines and the pricing, you're not quite sure how they got the pricing, etc. So it is a period that all of us as Ghanaians need to pay a lot more attention to the kinds of services that are being provided, the contractor arrangements and the costing of same. I think it is a time where uh, we should be concerned about whether people who want to take advantage of the system and defraud us of the resources that we already don't have to take care of bas basic necessities. Uh, Adam, I just want you to stay with us briefly because uh, the majority leader has been commenting on this matter. Uh, he points out in Parliament that um, 
um, officials of the Volta River Authority will be made to answer uh, some questions uh, in Parliament over the spillage of the Ekozombo Dam. We know that uh, more than 30,000 residents along the uh, river have been displaced uh, with properties running into millions uh, of cities. Uh, we'll hear from the majority leader first, but uh, just the fact that he's been pointing that out, uh, that some officers of the VRA would have to answer in Parliament. Uh, we'll get to that shortly, but what's your take even before we hear from the majority leader? I think that that is a very relevant step to take. I have been wondering... I mean, yes, we've been told that VRA is a very effective communication architecture. But from the ground, we, we, it appears that information ended up at district assemblies who did not pass it on to residents. Uh, we've had parents of people calling that they had no idea. In, in spite of the fact that there appeared to be a system in place, it doesn't look like the necessary work had been done, such that they had clear understanding of you are moving from this point to higher ground here. These are the areas demarcated. These are the people who support you. There, there, there has not been that kind of comprehensive approach to this crisis. And if we don't learn from it now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then the likelihood is that we're going to have these repetitions and sometimes probably with much more dire consequences than we have experienced this time. So it is an important exercise for the persons involved. Those are the helm of affairs to be asked what kind of emergency systems did you have in place? What kind of uh, information flow? What kind of uh, support systems to ensure that citizens, you know, would be afforded the protection and the safety and security they desire? How did we ensure that we didn't make the kind of losses we are seeing now? I mean, the kind of properties, uh, businesses, it's really gargantuan. And I think that that kind of effort from parliament and perhaps other bodies would make it much more likely that next time we'll do a better job of protecting um, citizens in the country. Mm. Uh, and uh, we're just uh, looking forward to, you know, uh, that parliamentary session. For you, what should be the key issues uh, for us to look out for um, b beyond, you know, the spillage and how that has affected uh, communities? Is, is there anything more in terms of uh, contractual agreements that we should be uh, scrutinizing? Well, I would be interested in finding out whether the moment, I know NATMO is at the heart of this, but what systems do we have to ensure that efforts are coordinated, are targeted, and they are not silos, people doing things independently, and at the end of the day, we don't get, you know, the kind of impact in terms of uh, alleviating the situation that the citizens have. Um, and in that instance, uh, how are we guarding the resources that come in to ensure that we don't have individuals and perhaps some groups taking advantage of the situation? It will be interesting to find out, do we have a system? Do we have a mechanism? Do we have a coordinated effort? Do we have somebody, you know, I haven't seen that so far, uh, and I'm sure that there are many Ghanaians who are bothered that how do we approach these kinds of crises uh, without a system in place and without the necessary, you know, um, reviews that could be done, whether it's weekly or monthly, and everybody is being given some feedback, some information, so that we can follow and uh, appreciate that the things are improving and we're making headway. Mm. I think that some kind of review in that direction would be useful. Mm. All right. Uh, uh, grateful uh, for spending some time with us. Uh, Adam Senanu, uh, we're grateful uh, for your... Thanks for staying with us. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Francis Xavier Susu, uh, Madina MP, who uh, also uh, is a human rights uh, lawyer, joining us via Zoom now on the latest that we're receiving, of course, the uh, bipartisan kind of support that we're hearing from NPs on the latest uh, uh, incident in Garros. The reason for which I want to talk to uh, the Honourable uh, Francis Xavier Sosu is joining us via Zoom now. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for spending some time with us here on The Pulse. The point about, you know, uh, m military and not just military, um, other uh, law enforcement agencies uh, going on rampage, uh, attacking innocent civilians in, in the cases uh, where we have any of their officers being attacked, as you're pointing out, must stop. Uh, but it does continue, isn't it, uh, given the latest incident we've seen from Garo. First of all, uh, what's your take on the legal, uh, possible legal remedies 
uh, that's open to residents of Gara. And beyond that, as a member of parliament, how do you feel we can effectively tackle this? Well, thank you very much and a uh, very good afternoon to your cherished viewers. Uh, I think that the situation that we are having uh, in the, the country today will continue to recur if the security apparatus would not stop using a very, very brutish way of dealing with <clears throat> what they claim to be an attack on security apparatus. Uh, we must understand that we are in a democracy. Um, and uh, the foundations of every democracy is what we call the rule of law. And rule of law means that in dealing with every situation, any and every situation, you would deal with them in accordance with law. Um, like uh, police officers, security officers are not different from any civilian. When a civilian violates another civilian, the remedy is either you report to the criminal investigations for the person to be uh, dealt with in accordance with law, uh, that is if the person may be charged for criminal, uh, 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 I mean, for with criminal offense, if um, there is evidence to that effect, if not, then uh, there will still be remedies in the civil court for assault. But if the military or the, uh, um, I mean, uh, yes, the military, I mean, for that matter, because it looks like that they have been at the forefront of this kind of uh, attack in recent times, the military will continue in the manner in which they are continuing. They would have to understand that they are being completely, completely lawless. There is nowhere in our laws that says that when there is an attack on a security officer or a military officer, you should go around people up and begin to beat them and subject them to all kinds of torture and dehumanizing treatment. And so I think that the, the, the military high rank, uh, as well as the, the people who are managing that, I mean, the security uh, services would have to bow their heads in shame because this continues almost every now and then, and we don't know when it's going to stop. I mean, if it continues this way, one of these days, I mean, the military is going to come face to face with the citizenry. And I can assure you that if they think that they have the power of the gun, they should remember that the power of the people can be stronger than the power of those guns because they may not be able to withstand when the people mass up together to come and defend, you know, the, uh, themselves against their brutalities. And so I think it is time the military would have to go back to the drawing board um, and, and, and then maybe retrace its step and do the right things. Uh, the question has come up again because we've seen several uh, commissions of inquiry um, you know, condemning these sorts of uh, attack. The uh, last one being the Jira Commission um, or committee working extensively on uh, deployment of military and how they go into uh, communities uh, as well. Uh, looking at what's happening now, I'm just wondering what problem, uh, the, the kind of probe you want to see in parliament as minority will solve? Uh, because there's extensive work pointing out um, why the military should be contained in such circumstances. Well, I, I think that, I mean, like you rightly pointed out, um, uh, what the, the, as a people, we like paying lip services to things and uh, do nothing about them. Uh, if you look at all these commissions of inquiries, uh, what has been the outcome of those commissions of inquiry? Uh, how many people have been brought to court and punished for their involvement in such atrocities? How many military officers have lost their ranks on account of either supervising or leading or ordering such, you know, violations of of innocent citizens. And so not until we, we, we really take matters seriously and deal with people who violate others in that manner, uh, ruthlessly in accordance with law, I don't think anything is going to change. And I'm hoping that moving forward, uh, hopefully uh, the parliamentary committees that are working on uh, various brutalities will come up with very, very strong recommendations which would, I mean, uh, uh, provide us like a clear pathway. I think that people who are found culpable must be punished. So long as people, I mean, leave these uh, rampages, uh, they supervise them and they go unpunished, it will continue to recur. Okay, uh, let, let's look at, um, you know, the parliamentary level now and what you in the minority are asking for. Uh, do you feel that the speaker should be 
you should be expediting work on this or what, what approach do you intend to use? Well, I think that the speaker would definitely would have to expedite action on this. Uh, we saw what happened at the um, uh, a while ago at, um, um, oh, I, I think, um, 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 uh, well, I think I'm, I'm just losing out uh, right. on, on that town near Tema. Uh, uh, the Ashima incident, the, you mean? The, yeah, the Ashima right, incident. Right, Ashima right. incident. Yeah, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we saw what happened at Ashima, and and um, we have not gotten to the bottom of that. We saw what happened at English Amount Room. We have not gotten to the bottom of that. I recall that there was one involving police, and you know, so it looks like there is something fundamentally wrong with law enforcement in Ghana. I mean, how both police, the military are working, there's something fundamentally wrong. And and it's so important that parliament will provide the, the I mean the way out because we are the representatives of the people. We are the, the I mean the, we, the parliament is the house of the people. And so if this bill continue to be violated in the manner in which they are violated and parliament does nothing about it, what it also means is that the people are going to lose confidence in parliament. So I'm really hopeful that the speaker of parliament will take special interest in this matter uh, and not only for this committee, but ensure that we can have a very speedy uh, 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 hearing of these matters so we can bring some people to book. Um, the question about even civilians and how they treat um, the security agencies in this Garu area uh, specifically, uh, there are countless um, you know, reports of how, because of the uh, nature of the community, some um, security personnel have been attacked in the community. To some extent, um, some of them have been killed. You know, the activities have led to the death of some of these security personnel. Uh, is that not also a factor to look at, mob justice? Uh, which is also creeping into this community. Absolutely. Definitely, that is something. Uh, we, we might um, have it just lost that. Yeah. Okay, right. what, 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 is, what is the cause of mob justice? What, what, what are the causes of mob justice? You know, remember that it is when people lose confidence in the... It is when people lose confidence. Uh, it appears that we're having some challenges there. Yes. With, uh, uh, Honorable, Honorable Francis Xavier, so, so we, we just lost you briefly. If you could just take that point for me again, uh, the, the issue about mob justice, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, you know, try and reconnect with uh, Honorable Francis Xavier Sosu, who is a human rights lawyer, also in Medina MP, uh, speaking to us on this uh, issue. Uh, Honorable, apologies there. We, we lost you briefly on the point you're raising about mob justice. If you could just uh, take that point for me again. We should ask us, so what are the root causes of mob justice? One of the fundamental causes of mob justice is the lack of confidence in the security service. Now, why would okay? Uh, why would citizens want to attack? Why would citizens want to attack a police service or attack a military installation or attack any security installation? Citizens would do that either they are suspicious or whether they don't have confidence in the security apparatus or they are not too sure why the security apparatus are there, and so on and so forth. That does not provide a justification for any citizen taking the law into their own hands. But I'm only saying that most often than not, people or citizens will take their laws into their own hands when they lack confidence in the security apparatus. And in dealing with those citizens, their security will not have to take the law into their own hands. So because two wrongs do not make a right. So if you say that citizens are taking their law into their own hands and attacking security officers, and so the military is also taking their law into their own hands and attacking civilians, whether they were involved or not, then what you are promoting is lawlessness. And that is not what you want to see in a society. Uh, the explanation we got from community leaders was that, um, you know, they were simply adhering to government's see something, say something campaign uh, which forms part of the anti-terrorism um, mechanism. Uh, and these individuals involved then were not 
um, uh, we're not necessarily using any uniform, identifiable uniform, a reason for which the community uh, had to engage in the activities they, they did. And th that brings up the issue about possible reforms to how you know, national security is deployed and, and what sorts of engagements they should, they should be uh, uh, involved in. Uh, looking at this, uh, this particular case, what, what's your recommendation on that? Well, I, I would say that the national security uh, itself has a lot uh, to do uh, because the national security and its operatives do not have any good image out there. And I am not too sure uh, exactly how they carry out their operations, in which form. Uh, but if you carry out your operation as a national security officers in a way that raises suspicions within the, the citizenry, then it means that you, you, you definitely need to reform your approach. Um, I, I don't know how many times national security officers have come face to face with citizenry in a manner as it happened in Garu. But if what happened in Garu is anything to go by, it means that, I mean, there should be some other ways that national security officers, when they come in contact with civilians, can quickly identify themselves as, as members of the security. And perhaps if they have an ID card or they have a way of, I mean, uh, validating or showing who they are, I don't think that citizens will simply jump on you and start assaulting you only because uh, they see you as a strange person who identifies as national security officer. I think that there is more to this than that. And that is a more reason why we need to really investigate this so that when you have listened to both sides and you have been to the community and you have all round information, it's easier to make far reaching recommendations. Mm. Uh, finally, there's so much anxiety in the community, the Garo community. Is there any message to the people there um, looking at the level of escalation? Well, I just want to, uh, first of all, commiserate with all the people there and say that um, um, they, they, they just have to stay strong and know that um, uh, these violations will definitely be investigated and those who are found culpable will be brought to book. Um, and they, they also to encourage them that, indeed, if you see something, you say something which is... Mm. Okay, uh, point well made there. Grateful for your time. Uh, Francis Xavier Sosu, uh, Medina MP, speaking to us uh, here on uh, The Pulse. And uh, now we talk politics uh, because the flag bearer aspirants of the governing New Patriotic Party, Dr. Also Fria Kutu says that he's capable of breaking the eight for the New Patriotic Party in the 2024 elections. Over 200,000 delegates will on Saturday elect the party's presidential candidate for the next election. Uh, he's, however, warning any attempt to subvert the will of the people will be disastrous for the governing party. Uh, Elton John Brobe uh, reports. Out of 958 delegates, Dr. Owusu Efi Yakoto pulled 36 votes in the Super Delegates Conference in August, enough to secure him a seat among the table of five. According to him, he went into the election hoping to make the first five. So our strategy was to make sure that we are in the five. And we, we are in the five. And this coming forth is a totally different ball game altogether. Because we are talking about 20 times the number. Yes. So how yes. do you respond to those who say that this clearly is a reflection of what is to come? Oh, well, I think they have, they have been it's a misjudgment. But why do you think that? It can change because the delegates down there are totally different from their leadership the, their leadership have disappointed them i'm very confident that those down there who have worked suffered so much for this party will take the right decision and that right decision is to choose also a free akuto as their flag bearer but after engaging more than half of the 900 super delegates he was shocked that only 36 voted for him the fear the delegates yes and that's true mm. but the thing is that for me, talking to out of the 958 who voted, at least I can say that I spoke to directly to more than half of them to convince, to, to, go, to sell my vision for the party and for the country. And I was very sure that at the end of it, they, they bought into my vision. Mm. At the end of the day, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So, <laughs> who's afraid was right that you fear delegates. But in the case of the 220,000 delegates, I don't think I've, 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 been, I've interacted with even 10% of them. Mm. Except that you rely on the structures that you build to get your message to, to them. 
But the insincerity of the delegates is not his only concern. The former Food and Agriculture Minister tells me the entire process was skewed in favor of one candidate. The reasons given by Mr. Tremartin for quitting the contest to start with before coming out to say that he's no longer with the party. Uh, those are very solid ones and I'm very sympathetic to those. See the implication of all this is the unity of this party. Mm. If we are, we are not seen to be having a level playing field, after 4 November it's going to be very difficult to unite the party mm. against the NDC. And for me that is my worry. Because if people feel that they have, been, they have, not, they have not been fairly treated, mm. how do you expect them to cooperate with, with, with the party after the contest when they feel that they haven't been treated well. For eight years between 2009 and 2016, Dr. Fi Yakoto served as a member of parliament for Kwada so in the Ashanti region. He was made food and agriculture minister when the MPP won power in 2016. During his six year tenure, he spearheaded a government flagship program planning for food and jobs. The son of the late Ashanti Hina linguist Bafu Akoto is counting on his strong roots in the Ashanti region to prepare him to victory. But he faces challenges there because the regional chairman, Bernard and Chibos Yakum, also known as Chairman Wontumim, has thrown his weight behind the vice president, Dr. Mamadou Baumia. The delegates down there have no respect for the conduct of the regional chairman. And his impression that he creates that he is in charge of the, of the delegates will be proven on the 4th of November. Whether the kind of percentage that the, his candidate got who will be repeated down there is still something that we have to wait for. Mm. But I'm confident that the, the message I've given to the people of Ashanti and to the rest of this country, the delegates know that this is the man. Dr. Fi Yakoto is hoping victory this weekend will help him reform the party and make it battle ready to win the upcoming 2024 general elections. This, he noted, would also enable him to have the mandate to pursue sustainable policies that are aimed at renewing the hope and confidence of the MPP fraternity. We want to bring fundamental reforms into the MPP. We are not in a good place, and I'm the first to admit and also the way the party is managed. We have a reg rules and regulations which say that if you are a party official, you don't define or come out to say that you are supporting this person or that person. Mm. And look at what is happening. The whole government, the whole parliament, the whole party, most of the party, people, uh, managers and so on, have come out openly to say that they support one person. And it goes against the rules. So that I, I alone should tell you that there's something wrong with our party. And for me, I'm very unhappy. For those who have worked closely with him, he is the best man for the job. Peter Otenda is a close confidant. Um, I would describe Dr. Kutu as a go-getter, somebody whose words are sacred. If Dr. Kutu says this, take it as a contract. He means every word that he says. Mm. And Dr. Kutu is a very serious person. He is somebody who is an authority. If he says, let's deliver this, he will ensure that you deliver to the latter. Mm. That is Dr. Kutu. Elton Brobe for Joy News. The quest to find a job uh, in Ghana fails, uh, but Abiola uh, Abiodun is not uh, one who allows incidences of uh, life to weigh him down. He quickly picks up uh, from that disappointment, sits up uh, his desire uh, pot, and also finds another handiwork doing. Uh, so he doesn't become a burden on anyone. Well, that's the story Hanal Dami narrates in today's series of hope. I said, Chaja, earpiece, cover, protector, assets, different kind of accessories. Abiola Toheb Abiodun is a father of three. He's been pushing this cart for over five years. He didn't start the business this way, though. I didn't know anything about the business. It was some, some of my friends that introduced me to the business. And I start with how much? I start with 100 CD as of that time. I start with like small uh, earpiece and charger. That time I used to carry around. But I thank God today that everything is my own. It's my business. So, and every day I go out, at least I'm making something out of it. So I have joy with what I'm doing. An origin of Ibadan in the Oyo state of Nigeria, the Polytechnic graduate narrate why he migrated to Ghana. Oh, I just came here to Ozu, at least as a man. The world has become a global village. 
if you are in somewhere and you, do, you don't have peace or you see how the situation of the place are going, you need to move as a man. That's why I came here. When his quest to find a job as an aluminum fabricator in Ghana did not materialize, Abiola found selling phone accessories as the best option to survival. My plan is that if I, I will apply for a company to continue the aluminum work. So and as I came here, I applied for some company, so they didn't take me. So that's why I start this one. Narrating his daily routine, Abiola was hopeful he will soon open his own shop. Sometimes I close around 11.30 in the night. So and I go to the market maybe sometimes around 2, 2.30. That's how I start. I can continue with this forever because this one is a business. For year two, if I get shop, I'm planning to rent shop for new time. If I get shop, I will make it in a big way and I'll start from there. Guided by his philosophy of life, Abiola says he's not for once regretted any step that he's taken in ensuring his wife and children are well taken care of. I'm not feeling disappointment. Because as a man, you need to be growing every day. So as I start this one, I'm even happy that I'm, I get something that I'm doing here. So uh, as I start from that, I never regret for one day. Because I thank God I'm st I started this one as at that time. And this business has helped me a lot. It helped me a lot as at that time. So gradually, now I get where they say. Just sometimes I just move around small and I pack for them and say. To the evening time I go close. And he does well to spend the money from his hustle with his family. Because I make them happy. Sometimes if I close, I'm going out. I used to buy something for them. Sometimes we go to Labadi Beach. Sometimes if I get one, sometimes we go to Bola Beach. Sometimes I take them to Medina for year post side. So sometimes we used to go out like that to go and enjoy ourselves. Abiola believes self-determination should be embraced by the youth, most especially as they pursue their goals in life. As a man or woman, you need to also for yourself. And the thing I see for it is that you need to believe in yourself, whatever you are doing. And you need to continue doing what you know to do more. Because the time I start is been tough. The time I start is it, very tough somehow. But I continue the struggle. Sometimes it will be day somehow, but I continue. But the thing I believe is that one day God will help me. But now He helped me because I, I thank God that I have something that I'm doing. And if you come here, you can't just day street be roaming about. You need to find something to do as a man. Don't follow people because the time I came here, I saw many people they are doing another thing. But for my mind, I make my mind say, I won't put my, by my hand for any bad thing. So I just face what I'm doing. So this is where I'm, I am today. Abiola go back to settle in Nigeria. The aluminum work is my handwork while I learn. It's good, but this one too is a business. I still learn this one because even if I leave this one, I go back, I can still start this business for Nigeria. So it's like I had another, I, ha, I see another opportunity. If I don't want to do the aluminum work again, I have another thing that I believe I can still do. Hannah Wadami for Joy News. Presec Ligon has cemented uh, its place as uh, the undisputed champions of the National Science and Maths Quiz after winning the 2023 competition for a record eighth time. Uh, they beat Tachimoto School and Opokuwari Opoku uh, School to write their names in the NSMQ history books as the only school uh, to have won the competition back to back twice in 2008. 2009 and 2022-2023. Max Olagoba has the rest of the story. The three schools came with one expectation to win the trophy. As they sang their anthems, the sound of optimism echoed within the four walls of the National Theatre. First, the gentleman from Upokuwari School. Chimota School. <laughs> and 
and the undisputed champions, Presec Ligon. Whether it's true or false. It was a comfortable lead for Presec Ligon in rounds one, two, and three. Things took a dramatic twist in round four during the true or false questions. Achimata School managed to close a 12 point gap to just three after the round. Achimota School with the same preamble B squared. Minus 4 AC is greater than zero. <laughs> Kenneth? False. You are right. Maybe formed from the dehydration of lactic acid. Achimota School was back to losing ways and Presec back to winning ways during round five riddles. At the end of the contest, Presec Legon had 40 points, Achimota School 28 points, Upukuwari School 23 points. This is our 30th anniversary, and so I am happy to also declare you the 30th anniversary champions of the National Science and Math Quiz. <laughs> oh, I wanna be all that here. Yeah, I wanna be all that here. Yeah, I wanna be all that here. This is the school I want them to go. This Anthem says we are happy at studios. Happy studios are we? At this point, we ask, are they studios? Yes, indeed, they've won this competition for a record eight time. So we can confirm that yes, they are studios. Are they happy? Yes, you can see the celebration in the background right now. I've now met Elizabeth Morty. Her son is Presec NSMQ 2023 winner Selena Morty. She says Selinam is living a self-fulfilling prophecy. Selinam's brother, Selassie Morty, represented Presec in 2019 but missed out on the trophy by just five points to Ogasco. She said his brother, Selinam, who was then in junior high school, prophesied that he will attend Presec and lift the trophy. He started his life learning from childhood, even in his basic school. It's always first. Always first. So I know you do it. And the brother too, contested in 2019. Oh, wait. Oh, really? Yeah. He was on stage in 2019. Yeah. Wow. He doesn't do anything in the house except learning. Mm. He likes learning very well. Wow. As, as a mother, what did you also do to support him? I'm sure you bought him a lot of science textbooks and all of that. He takes his brother's own, Celeste's own. Okay. He copies from Celeste. Mm. Mm -hmm. So while the contest was going on, what was running through your... Oh, I was first afraid. <laughs> you were what? I was scared. <laughs> it came to a time I was scared. During the riddles, I was yeah. scared. When Atmosa School was getting closer. I was scared, but so I was praying that I knew that God would do it. I told God that mm. he's been first mm. since childhood. Mm. So now that he's coming here, he shouldn't be second. Wow. Yeah. And I think God answered your prayer. Of course. Of course. Why, why, why do you see him in the next five years, in the next ten years? He said he wanted to go to the... Uh, Stanford University. Okay. So, wow. I'll be going for graduation then. Amen. Amen. I'll say amen. 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 amen.
final words, what do you have to say to a lot of parents who are watching this competition, who are watching the finals right now? Okay, what one do you want to tell them? I'll tell parents that we should always train our child to learn. Some of some the parents, eh, we like buying things for ourselves and then forget about things for the school. So I bet them. Yeah. It's good to support our children when they are good. Yeah. It's good to support them. You are sister or aunt? Sister. Sister? Yes, please. I see smiles all over your face. Yes. Tell me, what's the feeling like at this point? You're so oh, happy. I'm so happy. Yeah. Because he, my brother is a go-getter. No. He's a go-getter. He's a go-getter? Yeah, because when he was in, uh, that was junior high. Yeah. The brother was contested, that was 2019. Mm. And he got to the final, but they were second. Yeah. And he told us that he will make the grade and gain admission to precise. Uh -huh. And he's going to win the camp. Oh, boy, selling him said that? Yeah, he said that. And we're like, hey, you are not yet there, you are. He said he would do it. Wait, this was when he was in? When he was in form two. Whoa. When he was in JHS. Yeah. And I, I, I can see that whatever he said. That prophecy has come into reality. It has right come now. to reality. The 2023 NSMQ winners from Pesek could not hold back their excitement. I'm very excited about this. And it's very nice that you have worked so hard, you have put a lot of effort, and you have also prayed to the Lord and committed everything to His hand, and He has granted us a victory. So I can't be anything else but excited at this point. The global president for the that year's Dr. Ernesto Forisa Pon says they will not stop winning. So we are not tired. We want to win it, so we have a single, a double digit. That is why we win the tenth one. Then we we'll pull some bricks. <laughs> Then you return. You yeah. return from Wimbledon, but we we'll put some breaks. Yeah. There are a lot of people to win some, so we have two more years ahead of us to win it. Yeah. And we say congratulations going out to Presec Legon. You're watching the polls, so the Join News channel will be right back. Please stay. This is your election headquarters. Why don't we uh, cross over to the northern parts of the country where Dr. Mahmoud Obamia is on the final lap of his campaign tour, uh, heading into this weekend's uh, NPP presidential primaries. While well, the vice president has been touring some parts of the northern uh, uh, parts of the country, uh, and it's a good time to hear from, uh, you know, bring you excerpts of the a campaign and also the rallies that uh, the vice president has been holding here at SFs. The country, and you look at the results. Today, I want us to observe a one minute silence. Well, apologies there. We seem to be having some challenges uh, connecting to uh, the vice president uh, who's been making some uh, statements ahead of the uh, presidential primaries of the new patriotic party later this weekend. We'll bring you uh, the excerpts uh, in our subsequent bulletins. Uh, but it's time to stay on democracy because it's been receding in the West Africa subregion with uh, growing uh, threats of uh, violent extremism uh, which have dominated the conversations in the West Africa uh, region. Well, a former uh, British High Commissioner to Ghana, uh, Nicholas Westcott, is uh, 
optimistic about uh, the country's future and uh, matters of democratic development. However, uh, the former diplomat in an interview uh, discloses to me that Ghana would have to encourage more people to freely express uh, their views. In recent times, the uh, South region has grappled with unconstitutional change of governments, but Nicholas Westcott believes that Ghana can safeguard its uh, status as the beacon of democracy by encouraging free speech. Um, if democracy is about legitimacy mm -hmm. uh, and the will of the people, should we be encouraging this? Uh, we should be encouraging people to express their views, but uh, there is also, uh, we need to take account of history that in the past right. uh, military governments have not really greatly benefited. So only when, I mean, Africa's economic growth took up, took off in the 1990s, 2000s, which is the same time that there was a trend away from authoritarian governments right. towards democracy. The two do go together. Mm. Um, they're not uh, completely tied. China has achieved massive growth without any democracy. Right. But they have a government that is accountable in some ways through its own different Structure. kinds of structures. Each African country has to find its own way mm -hmm. of uh, achieving accountable governments and economic growth. And uh, I think throughout Africa, those who are in government, you can call them elites or yeah. whatever, need to find ways where they can respond to public views. And in our experience, the greater the transparency of government, the better. Because otherwise it's just too easy to use government to make, do very nicely for yourself and not so well for your people. Your projection of you know, the uh, trend in the sub region, uh, I'm asking this question because of some of the tendencies we've seen from these West African leaders. Mm. Mark Yisrael, for instance, is being criticized in his home um, region. Um, same for Cote d'Ivoire, heading in for another election. And yet all these leaders uh, still want to go beyond uh, the term limits. Is the reason for which the, the argument has been advanced that let's cap the term limits uh, through the sub-regional body ECOWAS um, so as to have you know, a stipulated time within the protocols of the sub-region mm -hmm. where a leader cannot serve beyond. Mm -hmm. Are term limits the way up? Uh, they help, mm -hmm. but they're not a magic solution. Um, you know, in Western Europe, uh, Chancellor Merkel ruled for, governed for 17, yeah. 18 years, you know, and remained popular and remained accountable, and that's fine. So they are not a, a magic solution, right. but they can help persuade people who might otherwise think, I'm doing very well, everybody loves me, perhaps I should stay a little bit longer. And catch a full playback of that interaction. Nicholas uh, Westcott on our social media platform and Joy News on TV uh, and also uh, Asseps on YouTube. But uh, let's uh, cross over once more uh, to the northern parts of the country. Dr. Mahmoud Obami are making some uh, very final comments uh, ahead of the uh, NPP's presidential primaries. Listen. I prayed about it and I decided that I will pick a form and win the flag bearership and break the eight for the MPP. When we went to pick the forms, there were 10 of us who picked the forms and our constitutions therefore mandated that there had to be a super delegates Congress to select five of us. When we went to the Superdelegates Congress on August 26, God listened to our prayers, and I won, and we won a decisive victory on August 26. The victory, the victory we won. Chubai, the victory we won on August 26 was across the country. And when you look at the results, Greater Accra region, Bahumia, Ashanti region, Bahumia, Western region, Bahumia, Central region, Oti region, Volta region, Eastern region, 
Western North, Ahafu region, Bono region, Bono East, Northern region, Savannah region, Upper West, North East, Upper East. Uh, it was a remarkable victory. And I want to thank the people and the delegates from the Upper East region. You did very, very well for in voting and in getting your chairman and your parliamentary candidate to vote for me. I am most, most grateful. But we have not yet finished. We still have one election to go on November 4th. And I want you all to vote 100% for Dr. Mahamudu Baumiao. The special, the special Delegates Congress sent a very important message because the whole party across all the 16 regions and the headquarters, the whole party was united behind Dr. Mahamudu Baumia. The whole party and the whole country. And that is quite remarkable. And as we are proceeding to November 4th, some of our opponents are getting more and more afraid. They know that given what is happening, the results of November 4th will be even more devastating than that of August 26th. So, they have decided to try to bring conflict amongst us. And the way they want to bring conflict amongst us is to tell lies, big lies, white lies. But I want to tell you that you should ignore all of those lies and let us stay united. Let us stay focused. The next few days, they will come out with more lies and more lies. We will continue to ignore them and we will go and vote 100% for Dr. Mahamudu Baumia. So, Chobai, if anybody asks you, why are you voting for Dr. Mahamudu Baumia? Tell them this. The first reason why I am voting for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is because he has the political experience, the election experience to win the 2024 election. Amongst the four of us, we are going for an election which is a presidential election, isn't it? 2024 presidential election. We are four people who are contesting. Amongst the four of us, it is only I who have the experience of presidential elections in Ghana. It is only me. None of them has been on a presidential election ticket. I have been as running mate in 2008, 2012, 2016, and 2020. So I know the ground. I have campaigned in presidential elections in the last 16 years. I've been to every constituency, slept in many, many, many constituencies, and I know the ground. So as they say, follow who know road. Follow who know road. I know the road. And not only do I have the experience, I have the winning experience. We need somebody who knows how to win an election. Nana Kufuadu and I have won two elections. 
one twenty sixteen and one twenty twenty. So if you want a flag bearer to break the eight, you need one of the aspirants who knows how to win. Uh, that's more from uh, Dr. Mahmoud Vahmia in uh, our subsequent bulletins. Time now to take you to Parliament uh, because uh, the House has been asked to consider a new instrument uh, which now creates a constituency uh, for the Santo Kofi, Akpafu and Lulubi areas. The constituency uh, which will now be known as the Grand Constituency is to rectify the constitutional anomaly that left thousands of residents in the area without representation in Parliament. The EC's action is uh, not allowing a resident in not allowing residents of South to vote uh, in the parliamentary elections in 2020 has been roundly uh, condemned. Let's get more from our parliamentary correspondent, Kweku Asante, who has more uh, for us. Uh, Kweku, what is uh, Parliament seeking to do under this new bill? Tell us more. Uh, we're unable to hear you, Kweku. If you could just uh, unmute it and get on the line for us. Yes, blessed. Um, this paper has been laid um, on behalf of the Electoral Commissioner, Madam Jim Mensah, by the Majority Leader. Early on, there were information swelling around that the Electoral Commission intended to create some additional 20 or 25 constituencies that have been now roundly disapproved. And that what is actually happening is that the Electoral Commission is seeking to create only one additional constituency, at least for now. You know that in the lead up to the 2020 election, and in fact, on the eve, of 7 December, 7 December, Madame de Mensa put out a notice that the people in San Chokofi, Lolobi, uh, Akpafu, the South areas, were not going to vote in the, uh, the parliamentary election um, because of the division of the region and the confusion as to where exactly they fell. And because of that, they only voted for the president, either John Mohammed Kufar or all the other candidates that stood in that election. And so for the last three years that this parliament has been in session, the people of South have not been represented. And finally, the Electoral Commission is seeking in this eighth parliament, because this eighth parliament will end next, next year, and they cannot add a new MP midstream if it's not through a by-election or any, any of that, that, that sort of information. So the representation of the people amendment instrument is now to create the South constituency, properly so-called the Guan constituency, so that in 2024, 7 December, the people in South can now vote and vote for a representative to be in Parliament in the ninth Parliament. Uh, I see. What, what's been the reaction from the minority side of that? Well, this did not prompt much response because this was just laying of a paper because invariably, the, the committee that this has been referred to will work on it and present a report to the House. That is when that will be debated and we'll get to know about the comments. But of course, the speaker that passed some comments about rectifying what has generally been a cardinal sin. In his words, he believed that it was improper that Parliament constituted did not have representative from a particular segment of the Ghanaian population. And so he believed that this finally... Um, um, issues and um, deals with that issue and so it was expecting that the committees would deal with it and so this instrument has now been presented to the uh, the, the subsidiary legislation committee chaired by doc dr dominica yini they will look at it they will present a report and if parliament approves of it finally so will now have a new constituency called guan in 2024 okay th this has been a, a huge debate in the house uh, i recall uh, Kofi Adam sent the class between the Attorney General. Uh, how is that going to look like in terms of the numbers in the House and, and uh, what other considerations are being made now? Well, blessed for this, I think the, the general consensus is that both sides of the House are in support of any idea that will allow the people of South to get representation in the House. And so it is not expected to be like any political hot potato, any political issue that will, as it were, make it difficult for this instrument to go through. So we expect that this will be speedily taken through the subsidiary legislation committee. They will look at it. It will come back to the House for a vote. 
it will be approved. That is the expectation we get. And then when the, the instrument matures clearly after 21 days, then this will come into force. And then both parties can now go ahead, elect parliamentary candidates in those, in those respective areas and allow for election to come through. What we understand now is that this is expected to go through without any, any, any letter or hindrance, so that both sides are really firmly in support of, of this. Okay, uh, grateful. Quick uh, Santi joining us for the latest on that. Um, thank you. Access to legal education across the country has been uh, constrained due to the de deficiency in infrastructure uh, preventing the institution from uh, admitting numerous qualified students each year. To pave way for more students to be enrolled uh, into the law of faculty, the University of Ghana has begun the construction of an ultra-modern law school equipped with lecture halls and state-of-the-art facilities in a bid to expand legal education. There's more in this report. The construction of the University of Ghana Law School, which would house 32 lecture halls, two moot courts, 100 offices, a 1,500 seater auditorium, and other essential facilities, would help alleviate the infrastructure deficit faced by the university. Speaking at the third cutting ceremony of the law complex, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Nanaba Apia Amfu, indicated that the construction of the multipurpose hall is timely as it will help accommodate the growing population of the law school. The University of Ghana School of Law, one of the flagship academic units of the University of Ghana, has experienced exponential growth in program offerings, student and staff population. From six programs, the school currently offers 41 programs. Consequently, the student population has also grown to over 2,000 from about 600 students. The staff strength has also been augmented to a little over 100 to meet the growing demands of the school. From these statistics, there could not have been an opportune time to commence the construction of an edifice fitting the status of the University of Ghana School of Law. And so this groundbreaking ceremony is therefore very tiny. The Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, Justice Gachu Tokonu, stated that the law complex will create an atmosphere that will foster critical thinking among students. I am hopeful that the envisioned state of the art facility will cut, that we will be cutting the sword for will not only contribute significantly to legal education in the country, but will also act as a leadership beacon to all involved in the learning, administration, and implementation of law and justice in the country. I know that the new University of Ghana School of Law Building Complex will present a practical expression of the atmosphere that fosters critical thinking and innovative research in law. Many seminars, workshops, and think tanks to shape a coherent and harmonious whole for the learning and administration of law and justice should also flow out of here. Project designer Ahmed Dodu provided a detailed overview of the project. What we have here is a 20,000 square meter building consisting of various lecture halls and um, administrative offices. So what we have is we have um, 32 lecture halls comprising of 1,500 seater lecture hall, 1,000 seater, um, 2,500, 4,250 lecture halls, 8,125, and then 16 city five lecture halls. And, and then we have over 100 plus offices for the, um, all lecturers because um, most lecturers want their own private individual um, offices. And then we have also, that's, so the building itself is, is, is it's like an L-shaped building and it's four stories high. So the lectures, the lecture halls are on the ground and first floor and then the offices are on the third, second and third floor. The project, which commenced in September, is expected to be completed within 24 months. As Dan Krumer's report for Joy News. And the paramount chief of uh, Jama traditional area in the Savannah region uh, has expressed his commitment uh, to collaborate with all traditional authorities in the region to promote education, unity and development. He indicates the topmost priority is to push education in the Jama traditional area uh, north uh, and within the more traditional area and the, the entire Savannah region. The paramount chief uh, of the area noted that he is currently discussing with other traditional rulers 
in the region about how to make education attractive to the youth. Uh, the professor uh, was speaking during his ordination at Jama in the Savannah region uh, from where Nesta Kafri uh, reports. I am conscious of the various challenges of my people and those are my responsibilities. For everywhere I look, there is work to be done. The living conditions of my people calls for action, bold and swift, and I will act, not only to create new opportunities and new jobs in a rapidly changing environment, but to lay a new foundation for development and growth. Especially through investment in education, Investment in education is investment in the secure and a stable future. We look forward to working closely with all well-meaning organizations such as the Bui Power Authority to extend their commitment of corporate social responsibilities to enhance educational attainment, especially in science and technology in our area. With the establishment of my foundation, Lanjago Kale Foundation to spearhead this ideal in conjunction with Michael Blaze School of Adenta Accra. We are committed to bringing quality education by means of virtual learning schools to the Jama traditional area, North Mo traditional council area, Bole district, Dega and the Savannah region as a whole. In this regard, we appeal to government to support us in the quest for the provision of efficient telecommunication infrastructure in our area and mobile data support from mobile, uh, from, uh, mobile phone network companies. Now Professor Kale encouraged Ghanaians to be careful about how they treat the environment to mitigate the negative impacts on the society. Now we are aware that in recent times, there have been rains and devastations affecting the uh, Vota River spillage. When you go to uh, Akosombo, there are disasters, waters have been spilling, and my, my geography background will tell us that global warming is a very important factor, and not only that, human factors, how we conduct ourselves in the environment influence the way that it affects the environment. So, my people, people of Ghana, let us be sensitive about the environment so that whatever that we do, we will know that it will come to bite us, it will affect us. Therefore, we should try our possible best to look after the environment, to avoid such devastation. Known in private life as Professor Noah Kufikale, a professor in land economy with Cambridge University, now Professor Lanjago Kale became the paramount chief of Jama traditional area in January 2023. He has a great deal of teaching and research experience in different countries, including the United Kingdom, South Africa, China, and Ghana. Now Professor Kale succeeds his late uncle, Na Koju Pambu, as the paramount chief of Jama traditional area. For Joy News, Nesta Kafu Yajuma reporting. And a report on uh, new circular vision for electronics uh, published by the United Nations in 2019 uh, indicates that, I beg your pardon, each year approximately 50 million tons of uh, electronics and also electrical waste are uh, produced, and out of that, only 20% is formally recycled. The report indicates that if nothing is done, the amount of waste will uh, be more than double by the year 2050 to 120 million tons annually. To tackle this, the Electro Recycling Ghana is urging all Ghanaians to join hands uh, in the proper disposal of electronic waste in order to save the environment. We have more. Some school children dismantling and reassembling electronic waste into useful product. This is part of efforts by the Electro Recycling Ghana, ERG, an electronic waste recycling company 
to enhance environmental sustainability as part of the 2023 German Day celebration in Ghana. According to researchers, the e-waste problem could expand into a global health crisis largely affecting urban areas if not addressed. To help deal with this concern in Ghana, ARG is embarking on a mission to reutilize most of the electronic waste that find their way into Ghana. The general manager of ERG, Kweku Adai, says this must be a concern for every Ghanaian. The U.S. contains chemicals, toxic materials. We normally find them in the oceans, along the, the river bodies, and we drink them. And in fact, we are bringing toxic materials into our body. And that is jeopardizing our futures. We can die, we can get sicknesses that cannot be healed, and we don't have the money. So the time has come for everyone in Ghana to join the crusade. Mobilize all the discarded materials, discarded electronic and electrical materials in your houses, in your homes, along the streets, in the communities for proper dismantling, proper repair, proper repair person, hmm? so that we can leave Ghana the way we want it to be. He wants corporate organizations with discarded electronic equipment to contact Electro Recycling Ghana for them to repurpose those items. We have corporate collection systems, so we go to companies and collect them. And we call on companies who have discarded materials to call on us. We will appropriately come and collect them. We, we don't take them for free, we pay you, provided they are not toxic. So those that are toxic, we will have to pay us to repair them. But those that are non-toxic, we will pay you and then properly dispose them of or repair, repurpose them. He believes the government must come on board to help recyclers like ERG to recycle more electronic waste. The laws and the policies must help us to operate. Beyond this, we need proper political system that enhances financing of the activities we do. Additionally, some of the materials cannot be disposed of here in Ghana, and we have to export them. Ghana is actually under some international conventions, and so the political leadership must help us assess the relevant permits to be able to export them for proper disposal. One of the partners of ERG, the German Chamber of Commerce, wants investors to support ERG in its effort to enhance environmental sustainability. Solomon Lodo is a project manager at the chamber. The impact of climate change is not just limited to countries or it's not just limited to a particular region, but it's a global issue. So companies or individuals or uh, donors or angel investors who are interested in e-waste or about environmental sustainability can actually partner with Electro Recycle Ghana because they have taken upon themselves to actually do the sensitization and also taking e-waste and recycling them. So if Ghana government and even uh, corporate society can support them, I believe the issues of e-waste, if not reduced, will be completely ripe off. It's a call for all of us to join in making the environment sustainable. The ERG says it's leading the way and needs the support of all Ghanaians. For Joy News, Samuel Kojo Brace, OEB. Well, the signing of the air on the pulse uh, with me, blessed. So, for more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. Thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.